what I'm going to do in this session is uh, basically take you through some of the thinking behind producing this um, research handbook, uh, methods handbook, um, and also to kind of run through some of the territory around research methods. Um, I'm going to try not to confuse myself. Um, part of the reason we're um, working on this is because a lot of people find method uh, challenging and you know it can be difficult to feel like you're really on top of it um, partly partly I think because um, we feel a certain sort of pressure to innovate with methods um, but also because maybe open education as a kind of relatively new field and a kind of interdisciplinary field throws up some methodological challenges um, so let me just uh, show you the basic structure what I'm going to run through is uh, some of the thinking behind it, um, a few thoughts around research methods and why it might be complicated. Um, I want to do a kind of brief look at the philosophical dimensions of research method, which um, I think is the bit that makes it hard a lot of the time. Um, and then go into uh, some of the um, some of the thinking around the idea that doing open education stuff makes a difference to method and sort of investigating that a little bit. That's partly the work that um, we would have had planned for the face-to-face -face workshop today if, you know, and have people working in groups and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I can share with you the, the kind of proposed structure for the report and um, how we're going to try and use some of the insights from the network to make sense of it all. So. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, so if you've ever come to the face-to-face um, -face seminars, we always have this kind of one-to-one -one time where uh, people come and discuss things with us uh, privately and sort of say, this is you know, something I'm not a bit unsure about with more work or whatever. Uh, and almost always uh, method is, is raised as a kind of area of concern. And um, for those of us who supervise PhD students, you'd often find that method is um, an area that people are quite worried about. So why might it be like that? Um, one is that method is hard, and as I've already intimated, you, you, you're kind of expected to engage uh, at a more philosophical level with some of this stuff, and that's often something that people have not done before. Um, uh, and it, it can really in, it sort of add to this feeling of being a bit of an imposter. Um, if you don't understand all the different research methods and how it all fits together and that kind of thing. Um, so it's definitely an area where when we were looking for this phase of GoGM where we could um, provide more support, this was an area that people told us they, they felt they could do with more support on. But I also think it's interesting from a sort of research point of view around openness and whether openness is actually making a difference to how we work and the kind of methods and theoretical frameworks we use and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think there's also some, some you know, because we're looking at a global network, there's also some um, differences in different cultures around this stuff, as well as different disciplines and that kind of thing. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> method is challenging, basically. Um, and it can also be very difficult to feel very confident about method, like you've really got to the bottom of it all. Um, I would say, um, just a personal observation about um, PhDs. Sometimes people feel they, they have to reinvent or come up with a completely new methods and you know, otherwise it's not original enough or something like that. Of course, you can just use well-established methods with new data and you don't have to do that. Um, but I think a lot of us feel some, some pressure to innovate in these ways and kind of uh, take control of the, uh, of the process in that way. So anyway, the idea with this um, bit of work was to uh, draw on the kind of people within the network and all of these, those different experiences of those researchers to try and come to some sort of collective understanding about what, what research methods might be particularly useful for open education research um, and kind of get that guidance into a form, um, a handbook or, or something like it, that we can actually give to people who join the network and say, look, you know, here's something that the network has produced that you might find useful. Uh, going forward in your PhD or your ED. So um, <clears throat> some opinions follow about research method. Um, there's a simple way of describing research methods and a complicated way. 
or several complicated ways? The simple answer, and this is the kind of answer that you'll probably get, you know, if you if you Google it or whatever, um, it's the way that you do research, and it's the way that data was collected in a particular study. Um, it may have a hypothesis. Um, it's often considered good practice in, in research to have a hypothesis that you're testing. Um, and at a more sort of meta level, the method that you use is supporting the claim that you're making on the basis of your research, uh, that you've created some new knowledge. And um, why does it count as knowledge? Well, you followed a particular method, and that's the sort of justification for it. So that's the simple answer. Um, I think the more complicated um, way of understanding it would say, look, the method is, if you like, just the top bit of the, um, I, mean, I think an iceberg would work quite well for this, but I think it's more of a pyramid. Um, but the, uh, the, the sort of the method bit is just, okay, which of these accepted techniques did you use? Um, methodology is the sort of more systematic approach to method comparing methods or critiquing methods, um, selecting between them, that kind of thing. Um, but you can only really do that on the basis of some theoretical position or difference. Um, and that could be something as you know as basic as one is, you know, you're committed to true answers being better than false answers. So you, you know, you're most interested in the methods that produce truth or something like that. Um, but once you start getting into these theoretical stances, obviously things get quite complicated quite quickly. And within each of these theories, they're differentiated by different um, ontological, metaphysical and epistemological commitments, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I would say that it, it's very difficult to actually engage with method at a reflective level uh, without at some point engaging with this philosophical dimension. And I think this is partly why a PhD is called a PhD, right? You, you engage with the philosophical aspects of your discipline. Um, but it's also that um, to, to really understand methods, I would say, you know, you have to understand some of these uh, elements. Um, as many of you know, my background is in philosophy, so I am maybe a bit more interested in this stuff than some people, but I would still say it's, it's pretty um, essential in research to have at least a grip of some of this stuff rather than skirting over it as soon as possible. Um, so just a brief segue into the sort of philosophical side of it. Um, so, starting with ontology. Um, ontology if, if, is from ancient Greek, um, and, and it's logical discourse about being in philosophy, um, and well, and in generally. Philosophically, it's often used to explore issues of existence and reality. Um, but in terms of research elements, it's a lot of it's about categorizing things just saying what's in the world, what exists, uh, what kind of relationships exist between things, um, and having a sort of position on um, on that sort of thing. Um, I got quite confused when I first started working in ed tech and people started talking about ontologies as almost like something that you could create or choose, like I've just chosen to do this ontology. And you know, I found that extremely confusing coming from philosophy because that's the opposite of what ontology is in philosophy. You don't get to choose what there is in the world. Um, you can describe it, but you can't, you know, just say, well, I'm doing research and this is my ontology. Um, so different ontologies effectively dominate in different disciplines and different approaches, different ways of, of, of doing it. And we also have these kind of um, overlaps in sort of interdisciplinary areas, multidisciplinary areas where you may have different ontologies, but could be different levels of compatibility. So when people talk about ontologies, they really start, they're really talking about your overall understanding of what there is. Um, and obviously, depending on what, what kind of things you think there are, that depends on, that has implications for the kind of research that you can do. Um, ontology is normally considered to be a subdomain of metaphysics. Um, metaphysics is probably even more confusing. Um, literally, it's, the word metaphysics comes from um, uh, Aristotle's, it's the book that he wrote after the physics. Um, and it really means uh, what, what is there beyond the physical? What's the fundamental nature of reality? Now this obviously gets you into territory you probably don't want to get into as a, a, a researcher, an empirical researcher. Um, but generally speaking, 
um, you kind of need metaphysics to fill in the gaps um, in sort of causal chains and um, uh, how, how things um, interrelate and affect each other. Um, we don't normally talk about people having a metaphysics, but um, if you do look into the sort of science of metaphysics, I've put a link on the slide, it's often seen to be a kind of necessary component. So it's a sort of necessary part of method, even if it's one that you're not necessarily going to want to engage with um, in detail. Um, so the, the final of the three, um, these are sort of three core areas of philosophy. Um, epistemology, episteme in ancient Greek is knowledge. So um, this is really about um, study of knowledge and the methods used to arrive at knowledge. So you've got, you've got a kind of quite clear connection with method here compared to um, the other two, arguably. Um, the key thing here is about what justifies a belief, what makes, it, what makes something true. Um, and in some ways, epistemology is the kind of foundational uh, inquiry, because for you to establish an ontology or a metaphysics, you need some way of working out, well, how do I know any of this stuff? So in a way, epistemology is the kind of the prior, um, or sort of logically or ontologically prior to even ontology. But um, anyway, it's, it's the one with the most um, clear connection to method. And my point generally about these philosophical elements would be they're interrelated. So depending on what your um, ontology is, that's going to have implications for your epistemology and vice versa and, and so on. Now, I don't think everyone has to go into this to the you know this this sort of depth that a philosopher would but i think it's important to understand um what the basis of your own claim is when you know that you're making as a researcher and you're saying i've produced some new knowledge okay well how did that happen um it's perfectly acceptable to just use an, an established method but you need to establish uh you need to use the established methods in the right context as well um anyway so one way of thinking about research methods is that they're essentially uh, epistemologies but their epistemology is targeted to a specific question or a specific kind of data that you're trying to understand um, the better aligned our epistemologies are to, with our methods the better justified we are in saying we've produced new knowledge but we also need to make sure that those epistemologies line up to the kind of knowledge that you're trying to produce that might sound a bit abstract um, one thing I think, um, so if you read the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry for um, epistemology, it frames everything in terms of cognitive success and cognitive failure. So um, you, you could say something like, if you have a false belief, that's a cognitive failure, but a justified belief would be a cognitive success. So um, it's partly about, you know, in philosophical, in, at a philosophical level, about how do you know anything? How do you know any of this stuff? Um, and it's, more abstract and it's more kind of extreme in a way, but I think it does give you some um, perspective on what we're trying to do as researchers uh, and scientists um, at a kind of abstract level. Uh, so often if you look into the kind of different approaches that you can find to this stuff, um, you'll see positivism, uh, interpretivism and sort of critical approaches. Sometimes positivism is conflated with quantitative approaches. Sometimes inter interpretivism is conflated with uh, qualitative approaches or just called constructivism or something like that. Um, I think that's slightly unhelpful. I think it's helpful to note that positivism will always skew quantitative and it will, you know, they'll tend to go that way. Um, and interpretivism will tend to go qualitative, um, but they're not absolute um, and, you know, in practice, a lot of people use um, a sort of pick and mix approach sometimes, right? So I've got a bit of mixed methods days. I've got some qualitative stuff, some quantitative stuff. Um, and I'm going to kind of put it all together. And so it's putting it all together is the bit where, you know, we have to take uh, care with it. Uh, one way of doing it is to have different research questions using different methods or something like that. Um, the third um, paradigm, if you like, uh, is a kind of critical approach. Um, often the thing that differentiates that is that you've got a kind of explicit, um, I would say emancipatory interest. You've got an interest in kind of showing relationships of domination or showing power structures in the world or something like that. And this would most obviously align with kind of social justice approaches in open education research to me. Um, but 
for each of these kind of paradigmatic approaches, you've got ontological claims, epistemological tendencies, at least, um, and you've got different uh, goals and also different understandings of the role of the researcher. So for the positivist, essentially, the idea is that there's an objective world. And as the researcher, you've got a kind of privileged insight into it because of the methods that you're using. Um, an interpretivist would be more likely to kind of say, well, look, reality is this complex whole and the researcher is, you know, just a part of that. They're within it. Um, and from critical approaches, you have the idea that the um, the researcher is a kind of um, potentially a sort of emancipatory force, you know, and is kind of um, got some sort of uh, interests at stake quite explicitly in what's happening. Um, and so, for instance, you know, feminism and feminist studies would kind of fall into that category. Um, so one question at this point I would just throw out there really is, does open education align more specifically with any of these or not? Um, I just kind of leave that for you to reflect on for a second. Um, so some um, research methods are kind of um, classically associ associated with these three paradigms. Um, I won't go through them all now, but I'm sure you can recognize some of these um, methods. Um, they're often not really kind of, um, they're not really mutually ex exclusive, these categories, right? There's a lot of overlap. Some people will even say there's only really two approaches, positivism and the other stuff, right? Where you just kind of mash critical and interpretivist approaches all into one, you know, um, one, one lump. Um, uh, but the point here really is that there's, there's kind of paradigmatic associations um, here. Often in educational research, we have um, mixed methods, taking bits from each. Um, and so part of the difficulty will be, okay, how do we put that all together in a way that makes, doesn't start running our claims from different um, types of questions into each other. So anyway, um, lots of different ways you can um, cut up this particular cake. Um, found lots of interesting graphics, uh, which haven't gone in, gone, reproduced all of them here. Um, this table gives you a, a kind of neat summary of ontology, epistemology, methodology, and method for um, five uh, paradigms. So the, the additional ones here are subjectivism and pragmatism. Um, I think that's, you know, an interesting table. Uh, obviously, you could go, you know, you could probably spend 10 weeks, uh, 10 weeks of a course talking about a method in this way. Um, I would note that you can criticize any of these positions um, and they have all been criticized at some length. Uh, even here, this is a, uh, Aeon is a, a kind of philosopher's blog. Um, so there's a critique there of like, if you like what we think of as the gold standard of statistical validity, kind of um, double blind peer reviewed stuff, um, which we use in medical research. Um, you can criticize that, right, quite happily. So you, you can criticize any of these things from, from anywhere. Um, and I don't say that to sort of imply that they're not meaningful uh, or not, not important, but just that certainty is in short supply, right, when it comes to research. Um, and we have to be sort of aware of the limits of the different methods that we use um, and the fallibility of the methods that we use. And that, I think that has implications for the kind of claims we make. Um, just briefly on this idea of, you know, um, methods and their fallibility, if you're familiar with uh, Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions and the idea of paradigm change in science, some people will kind of misinterpret this a little bit and say, well, look, if these paradigms are always changing, nothing, none of it really means anything, right? It's just relative, you know, and, you know, none, truth is a fiction sort of thing. That's not really how it works. Um, and there's still validity within the existing paradigms um, as this kind of cycle keeps going around and gradually iterates and changes the way that we do and hopefully improves it. Um, uh, I just wanted to conclude this section with this quote. Um, George Box was a British stati statistician. Um, and I like this quote, it basically said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So, um, and he's talking about statistics, but I think it probably uh, applies to research in general. There's always going to be a problem with any particular research paradigm. You can always find you know, an issue with it. 
it sort of brings us back to the question of well, why why are we doing this, right? What's what's useful about a method or a theory in the first place? It's going to help you to try and answer a question with the limited time and resources that you've got to try and answer it. So um, this can be a sort of useful um, thing to remember, I think, when you're kind of uh, deep in methodological quagmire. Anyway, so um, thinking about openness, um, and this is the bit where I think we need to do a bit more um, fleshing out. Uh, but I'm working with this idea that um, open education research is kind of reach, reaching a kind of maturity um, as a discipline. And I think we've seen some more, you know, if you look at some of the work that's come out recently around um, sort of citation network analysis, looking at um, how literature reviews around open education have changed since the 1960s, excuse me, looking at the discourse, becoming more aware of our positionality as researchers and that kind of thing. Um, one challenge for us maybe as a network is, can we articulate the ways in which open education research is, is, should be recognized as a field within itself? So we're still going through the, the data that we got back in the survey and stuff to try and sort of make sense of that. Um, one, one interesting thing I think is that uh, when, um, when OER research at least um, first started, there was a strong obligation to meet a certain sort of standard, if you like, uh, methodologically, where we want double, you know, we want um, we want blind comparisons, control groups. We want to see are the students who are using OER um, showing any difference with groups that are not using OER, and we can try and control as many variables as possible, and so on. It's quite a sort of positivist way of um, understanding the impact of educational resources. Um, partly it's, I think, it's coin of the realm in, in the USA if, if you're trying to um, uh, bring about change in, in educational institutions, that's what they want to see. So it's partly influenced by that. Um, but there's also, you know, room for open education research to be done quite differently as well. Um, so one question is, how do we, how do we innovate our methods uh, and the way we do research whilst still maintaining our claim to sort of the validity of, of what we're doing. So it's just some ideas really and um, to explore the, you know, if you like basic contours of what that might look like you, around using open data, around kind of building tools and instruments for other people to use to replicate your research, um, being quite sort of open and transparent about the way that we do things. Um, making explicit claims to social justice or some other social interest, um, and also using technologies um, to um, gather and analyze data and that kind of thing. Um, so we have some examples of these things kind of in the report. Um, there are also examples you know, provided by members, um, but we don't really want to go into them all right now, but we do have examples of these, these kind of things that we can, um, we can pull in. Uh, so um, just briefly on the kind of data that people are sharing. Um, so earlier in the year, uh, sorry, last year, um, Martin gave a presentation at the uh, Pan Commonwealth Forum in Scotland. Um, and we've done a basic kind of um, analysis then of like, okay, well, who's doing what kind of research within the group? Um, and so these, this slide and the next slide just kind of summarize um, what we found. Um, so in a way, this is now a more kind of like detailed um, list, if you like. Um, so these are the, this is the actual kind of, these are the methods that people told us they were using in their own work at the moment. So um, a more, and still working out the best way of kind of categorizing this stuff. Uh, so quantitative, people are looking at demographics, they're looking at document analysis, uh, tracking of key metrics and KPIs, um, mapping stuff, uh, doing pattern recognition, looking at quality metrics, and possibly within that um, is not not exactly. Um, there's there's almost like a sort of thread of uh, stuff that's inspired by computer science and HCI, um, which is partly um, partly quantitative, but also has some qualitative elements depending on how you're doing it. 
Um, but within that, you've got an interest in accessibility, using learning analytics, uh, social network analysis, uh, pulling data from virtual learning environments, and doing uh, user experience uh, testing. More qualitative um, stuff, we have uh, people so they're good at axial coding, looking at biographical method, focus groups, interviews, holistic analysis, interpretive research, observations, phenomenography, phenomenology, surveys, and thematic analysis. Um, there were also some stuff which I'd probably call a bit interdisciplinary or maybe mixed methods would be, you know, uh, acceptable in some cases. Um, so some people said they were doing evaluation. That was like their method. Uh, but obviously evaluation kind of straddles um, qualitative and quantitative uh, typically because you'll often collect some quantitative data and also some qualitative data to sort of make sense of it. Um, but you also get people doing synthesis of existing research. So they're just kind of looking at what's already out there and pulling out useful stuff. Now, um, one of the ideas we have is that we'll have a research methods report, but we'll also have um, a kind of theoretical frameworks report or handbook maybe is a better way of saying it. Um, but when we said, um, tell us about the methods you use, a lot of people just said, well, this is my framework that I'm using, or this is my theoretical lens that I'm using. So I think we might need to do some more kind of thinking about what's the relationship between a method and a theoretical framework in an open educational uh, open education research context. Um, but anyhow, um, so the theoretical frameworks people said they were using uh, include action research, connectivism, content analysis, communities of practice, complexity science, critical realism, ENIAN or ENIAN probability analysis. I had to look it up. Uh, grounded theory, netography, open educational practices, phenomenology, realist social theory, rhizomatic learning, self determination theory, social justice socio-technical perspective, system analysis, theory of bound, planned behavior, topologies, and value creation stories. And to me, that sounds like a pretty you know, interesting list of methods to kind of bring together. Um, but I think we need to do a bit more kind of, um, a bit more reflecting on how to, how much of this is theoretical and how much of it's about method. And I've already said that anyway, it's hard to separate the two. Um, so, that's the kind of stuff that we got back from the survey. Obviously, in addition to that, we've got everyone's little kind of uh, statements about what kind of things they find useful or problematic about their research methods, and especially in the, in the context of open. But that's not in this presentation. Um, that's going to be in the draft, basically. So um, the report itself. So the idea was that today we'd do some sort of group exercises around method um, with the people in the room. Um, and just try and kind of answer some of these things together. Um, what I'm proposing instead is that um, sometime in the next sort of week or two, we'll share a draft as a Google Doc to the network and just invite comments on it. Um, but what we can also do today, in we've got sort of 20 minutes odd left in this session, is just to sort of get some feedback on um, the proposed structure of the report, what's in there, and whether there's anything missing um, that people think, yeah, actually, this is what I would want from that handbook. Um, and I've also got some sort of discussion prompts as well um, to help people think about some of this stuff. So um, the basic structure of the report at the moment kind of follows what I've just presented. Um, so you would have an introduction, which kind of says, you know, this is what this book's for. Um, some overview of the different research method typologies that I've just kind of um, gone through very, very briefly. A section which we didn't really have in this, which would be more about open education research and just kind of saying, well, this is what it is normally. And these are the kind of main varieties that you find maybe doing it a bit as a sort of historical account. So starting off in the, in the 1960s or something. And um, we already have some resources that kind of give us a shortcut to that. Um, but the idea being to more clearly distinguish those things that um, uh, are distinctive to open education research. Um, then to go on to say, well, these are, the these are the research methods used by people in the networks. Here are the insights that they have about using those methods. So um, whether they found it good, whether you know, they would use a different method in the future or that kind of thing. Then a section showing here are some useful resources, and um, here's where you can find more detail on some of these things. 
um, and a references section. So the idea is it would hopefully be relatively um, straightforward to do that, um, but it's definitely good to have other people's input in terms of, you know, because you're technically the audience um, for this handbook. So anything that you think is missing would be helpful to know. Um, so maybe let's maybe let's talk about that for a second because I can see um, there's some chat in the chat box. Um, it's coming in quick. Can't actually read it. Hang on a sec. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to where the comment starts. And if anyone wants to speak, I can give them microphone access if it's easier to yeah, explain. Please, please do. Okay. okay, so um, I'm looking at. Sarah saying she's been thinking about method theory and frameworks for some time. Um, I don't know if you want to come in on that, Sarah, at some point. Um, Danielle uh, talking about, OK, in a way, a more practical thing, right? Um, permissions. So in a way, we need a kind of a sort of guide to using open resources, even if it's just brief. Um, and Daniel was also talking about ethics. Um, okay. yeah. and I, I think that, that's right. There's a danger this becomes a you know a 500 page report. Um, yeah. Well, we do have. So, uh, yeah, I think yeah we, we have a, a researcher pack, don't we? Rob? So, and also to say we're going to have a, a third report to so do a report a year, uh, which kind of brings us stuff together. Um, so it may be we need to. Sort of weave those things in together, um, but you're absolutely right. Then we don't want to sort of, but by its submission, imply that it's not um, it's not an important factor. Um, I did turn my mic on, and I just recall that Rob, you already have a draft ethics manual of some kind, because I I asked about it when I was pulling my hair out, and I did read it and went, oh hell, that was handy. So maybe it's a link, a link opportunity rather than a um, yeah. so we, um, we, a replicate. We do have the um, OER Research Hub Ethics Manual that was written in sort of 2012. Um, but then there's also a couple of papers, including I've, I've wrote a framework for ethics, um, which can really point people towards. I think what, you, what we might need in this is just to kind of, uh, whether it's just a small section or something, just like to highlight that different methods will have different. Ethical considerations, kind of thing. So it's not, it's not just like a kind of handy pack saying it, but yes, yeah, I think that's right. Yes, um, it's not so a free for all. Yeah, that's right. So you, you mentioned acknowledgements. Absolutely, we should stress that. So everyone who contributed to the um, report will be uh, acknowledged as, as authors up front as well. Yes. It'd be nice to just see a paragraph about how, you know, about how yeah, you call uh, for it and what the extent yeah. of what was brought in. Um, so that would just provide some really useful context and be kind of handy if um, it, it seems to me that it may have sort of informed the whole report, not just the insights, but I could be wrong. What do you think? Yes, I think you are. I mean, it kind of draws upon our, our whole experience. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I think in the introduction, you need to make, in some ways, that there's a kind of, I know I always want to put a phrase in this, but also back to a kind of eating our own dog food thing. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's about openness, and we've developed this report through open practice, and it's to kind of encourage that there's a kind of full circle thing. Uh, Igor's got a comment. Do you want to talk, Igor? Give, let me give you a microphone if you want to raise your point. I've unlocked your mic, Igor, if you want to talk. So Igor's saying um, some practical examples under some of the sections. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the idea. And um, well, everyone who responded, I think we had something like 25 uh, responses. Um, everyone gave us those examples of how they're actually using particular methods in their own work. I just didn't didn't feel like the right time to re reproduce all that in this presentation. So we do have examples. Um, and 
potentially you could you can collapse together the research methods and research insights bit together where you would say okay one side of the page is a method and the other side of the page is someone's example or their statement about how they used it in their phd and in, in an open educational context rather than having them hear all the methods and hear all the insights so we just need to sort of play around a bit with that but the idea is that you have the kind of um sort of dry academic explanation but then you'd also have here's an example of someone who potentially you could contact and ask about this stuff if you were really interested in it um i like the two-sided approach rob um mm -hmm. having this the pages would with with the sort of the authorial voice of 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 you know the network on one side and having the researchers voices and examples on the other and um i certainly uh, just speaking purely for myself but i love to read other you know like sidebars within other people's voices so if there was actual excerpts and people were happy to be quoted it, it's sometimes really nice to just have a different voice because they describe what they're doing slightly differently and and you never know what com combination of explanations goes ding for someone so i um I would see no problem, you know, pending, you know, everyone being happy with acknowledgement of just citing actually some of the excerpts from just even a sentence or two of the quotes from what was submitted, if it illuminates things. Yeah, so, so that, thanks. Yeah, that's useful. I mean, mm -hmm. this was this was the idea. We sort of tried to design it into the survey so that we'd have this um, structure um, by asking people specifically about their own insights into the, you know, and we can say, look, here's, here's, the, here's if you like, here's the objective account of what these methods are, and here's an actual particular use of it that someone's describing uh, in a context that's hopefully relevant to other network members. Um, this will be a kind of, you know, potentially this is also something that we can, we can update each year um, with new members or something and, you know, create a new version of it, but we'll have to see how that goes, I think. Um, if you have any sort of any any additional thoughts around stuff that's missing or stuff you'd like to see, or what would be useful? Um, Virginia is saying that uh, but an extension of this going forward might be a series of podcast video casts focusing on a specific OGN methods. Something we could uh, all contribute to. Uh, I'm thinking a bit like uh, Andy Tattersall's SCAR research hacks. I like it. We've got like families of likely suspects in in similar areas that would be, um, I'm sure, prepared to chip in, and you know, two or three people in each chunk of a family of areas could be really cool. Yeah. So, so Deb is asking about can you can you give us practical examples of how people's ontology, epistemology, and methods all align? If only people's ontology, epistemology, and methods did all align, that would be very nice um most of the time it's the it's managing the misalignment is what we do um that, uh, very few people explicitly describe their ontology and epistemology at length in their phd and in, in the ones that i've seen anyway certainly in educational research uh, most people kind of want to get it done as soon as possible right and get it out of the way and hope they don't get asked too many questions about it is that fair <laughs> shocking that fair um but we could maybe show a sort of idealized example of how these things align. Um, in, they align in theory. <laughs> I got two really good examples that I could give you, Rob. That I that um, that were openly published theses that I just found app that I just clung to like a lifeboat when I was threading through my own um, logic of all of all of the. Um, the underpinnings and um, one of them's Bond Stewart's thesis. So her, um, it's just magical to see the um, the beliefs leading through to the methodology, to the methods, to even the way she wrote the headings and wrote the structure of, of her thesis. It's, it's um, that was just unreal. So there are some good ones out there. The gentleman for the second example i relied on less but it was still very striking in its powerful alignment and not particularly long either um that so i great. think we could link example. yeah I, I i worked really hard to find examples of critical research that had that strong alignment and worked really hard on my own um 
statement as well. So, you know, if I don't get completely hammered in the <laughs> examination, I'm still waiting for the results. I might be happy to share it too. <laughs> but I do feel like it was it was consistent all throughout, but I just needed to find a way to – I took a lot of time to be able to – uh, rash, make that a rational um, yeah, argument, I suppose. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. And yeah, who to so rely yeah. on for that, you know, who I could call on in terms of referencing to justify why that is is a particular thing. So, um, yeah. But I think it's a really important point. Um, using these methods is supposed to make it easier, right? It's supposed to make it manageable, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, and it should give you a structure. It should give you a way of reporting and a way of kind of understanding. Well, you know, if I've if I've done everything right, then I've found something out at the end of it. Um, I like the idea of using methods to structure reporting and that kind of thing um, personally. Um, but I think yeah, if we had some some good examples um, of papers, we could definitely put them in or PhDs or whatever, and say, look, um, here's a here's a sort of convincing account of how these things all line up in someone's work. Mm. That sounds good to me. Yeah, and again, the ones that I would have would be all within that critical paradigm. So, it, again, you could cluster, um, if we go back to the podcast idea, you know, that would also be a, um, not a bad account to look at, you know, all three of them would be a related family. So, you know, those examples could have a couple of useful um, recycling uses. Yeah, that's useful. Thank you. Um, so we're just going into the last 10 minutes. Um, I'm quite happy to um, have more suggestions on what should be in, in the handbook. Um, while I was kind of putting some stuff together around different ways of dividing up this kind of thing, um, I also kind of generated some sort of prompts, if you like, on um, so the examples given for how you frame your research and what motivates your research, um, those examples are all coming from answers that we, we got. So what's your research doing? I'm basically describing something that's happening um, or I'm trying to identify a pattern. I'm trying to challenge an existing narrative. I'm trying to draw attention to something that's overlooked, I'm trying to support practically you know, what people are doing professionally. Uh, I'm trying to come up, come up with a new theory or describe a new trend. I'm trying to refine the roles that people have or something like that. So so even, you know, there's a kind of underlying question with any research thing. Like, why are you doing it? Right? What are you trying to get to at the end of it? I would say that your research question is intimately connected with this sort of framing, right? If you're, question, if you're trying to describe something, then your research question should reflect that. And then your methods are going to be, um, certain methods will be indicated, right, depending on how you frame what you're doing. Another way of sort of looking at this is to say, kind of, how, how's your research question? Um, have you spent enough time refining it and getting to the point where you actually uh, have a good idea of what kind of methods you'll need and what kind of data you will need to answer this question? Because um, you don't want to be, you know, at the you know, three years in and then realise, mm, my question is not really working. Um, so I would say that these things, you know, if you think about the sort of critical paradigm, if you've got, you know, why are you doing this? Well, I'm trying to, um, draw, you know, uncover relationships of domination in, in society or something like that. That's going to have a big influence on how you approach this stuff. So, um, so one way of dividing up research, again, is by the purpose of it, right? Some research is descriptive. Some research is about um, narratives and challenging them. Some research is about patterns and so on. Um, so it's just an alternative schema, really, for how you could divide things up. Um, but I, I think they're quite useful things to reflect on. Then, um, similarly, if you like, a more sort of practical, um, so you know, we have the idea of producing knowledge, but um, increasingly we're expected to come up with sort of impact what we do. Um, and, you know, we should have some outcomes right, from what we're doing. It's not It's not necessarily a good feeling to spend a lot of time working on some research and it just kind of, gathers dust on a shelf somewhere. Um, so again, we're thinking about the research question is, well, what's, what's, what, what, will we, what will we gain from answering this research question? Um, and 
uh, I'd invite us to also think about whether the open approaches are actually adding any value to this potentially. So some examples here, um, lots of people who are working in the network have a direct influence on practice in their institutions. Most of us are producing some sort of data that can be reused, open access publications. So we've got these artifacts out there um, that uh, have some value. That's the idea. So maybe maybe one of the, the elements around openness is this idea of kind of additional value or doing things that add a bit of value for other people or for the community or for the commons and that kind of thing. So yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to um, come in on any of these kind of ideas about framing research, formulating a research question and how it relates to method or whether open approaches are adding any extra values to what we're doing. Duskin's got her hand up. Have you found the microphone button, Duskin? So yeah, you should be there yeah, hi, I can hear you, Tuskeen. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, I was wondering, so in my research, I, I was always confused between what fell into my epistemology and then what was the learning theories that I was talking about. So whether I was talking about critical pedagogy or Vygotsky's social constructivism or uh, behaviorism. And yeah, I just... I was because they often connected a lot with the type of epistemology that I chose, which was like a social constructivist, a constructionist um, epistemology. Uh, so, yeah, could you elaborate on the connection between those two? And also, um, the kind of overlap with the terminologies like constructionist or constructivist, and um, yeah, how these all work together, because I feel like that was. The, the biggest problem I had, trying to figure out where it goes in my research? Good question. Um, quite a complicated question, um, I think. Uh, so any, any claim, if you like, uh, has an epistemology if it's verifiable, right? So if there's a way of testing whether it's true or not, then it has an epistemology. Some things are empirical, right? So there's scientific questions are empirically uh, answered. Some are more theoretical or philosophical, but um, so philosophical methods are used to work out whether a theory is consistent in itself or something like that. For any learning theory, I mean, just by calling it a theory tells you something, right? It tells you that it's not necessarily something you can prove empirically. Um, theories are often more like tools that we use to uh, help us progress something. Um, so if you think about learning theories traditionally, they often had a kind of knowledge acquisition model for how learning happens. So the teacher knows more than the learner and then they teach them something and now the learner has that knowledge and, and that kind of thing. Um, so there's an epistemology there, right? There's, there's an idea that um, knowledge is something that can be transferred in that way, that um, you know, we can measure knowledge and these kind of things. So there, there's going to be some assumptions around it, but it doesn't necessarily commit you, depending on which theory it is, it's going to have different theoretical commitments. Um, but all learning theories are going to be grounded in some idea of you know, an ontology and, and an epistemology and metaphysics. So any, any idea that you can come up with, you can always say there's an ontological, metaphysical and epistemological dimension to it. It may not help you to know that necessarily, but there's always going to be those dimensions. Um, and I would tend to see those philosophical aspects as if you like the kind of um, the foundation for any any other claim. And this is partly my background, right? But um, philosophy is where it kind of bottoms out and you end up having to justify what you're doing philosophically eventually, if you keep pushing skeptically and interrogating things. Um, most, most learning theories are influenced by, uh, you know, they're sort of socially and historically situated. Um, and um, I think uh, they're all they're influenced by different theories that you know emerge at the time. So, for instance, you know a lot of the modern kind of learning theories are based around sort of constructivist approaches and that kind of thing. Um, but it's a combination of um, what's what's practical. I think people use what's practical at the time. Some people have more overarching theoretical commitments than others. There's, there's overlap between a lot of this stuff, but it's not clearly, you know, there's not clear distinctions between a lot of them. Um, and you can you can divide up the the spectrum of options in lots of different ways. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, a really important thing to draw attention to. I'm afraid there's no simple answer other than um, 
I would say the further you go into the kind of um, philosophical aspects, the more you can kind of arrive at a final justification for what you're doing. But for most people doing PhDs, that's going to take you pretty far away from what you're supposed to be doing. So, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not easy to put all that stuff together, I would say. Um, we're coming up to the next session. I definitely want to quickly run and do a, a comfort break. Um, I was going to say, I think Rob's prompts here are very useful. Um, but one thing I always ask when I'm an external examiner, as Taskeen will know from uh, last week, is um, try to think about, so going back to that box quote that Rob put in, it's um, every methodology gains you something, but it also loses you something. And I think sometimes people get so in love with the methodology they've got, they, they won't see any negatives about it. So I think that's a good question to have in your mind to go into a buyer, you know, like it may have been the ideal choice for you, but it still would have lost you something. You know? so it's always useful to think about that as well. Um, good. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, that was excellent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, so did you say when we're hoping to publish the report? Rob? Uh, I think we could probably have. Um, a draft ready for review in a couple of weeks and maybe published by the end of April. Cool. So you could all pile in then and give us comments. So it will be a kind of productive and collaborative.